guys welcome to another wonderful and inspirational session dab in the hope seat my name is esther kwesa in the seat today we have a brother a friend a husband and most of all a presbyter of the presbyterian church of ghana hope congregation he is a mentor to a lot of young men and women in the church a ray of hope and an inspiration to many of us I am privileged to be interviewing him today as he inspires me a lot. Without saying much, let me welcome Brother Ronald Opon Adum. Thank you very much. Brother Ronald, you're Hi. welcome. Thank you, Esther. Brother Ronald, tell us, who are you? Hmm. Um, like you may know by now, my name is Ronald Opon Adum, and um, I'm married. A wonderful woman. I have four kids and I'm the first of four children as well for my parents. Uh, I'm happy to have both parents alive. I, in terms of academics as well, I have an MBA in marketing and uh, I currently work with a company by name Metropolitan Ghana. I work with their health session. So, which is known as Momentum Health. Very soon, we are going to be known as Metropolitan Health. Um, I'm blessed to be the operations manager in that place. And um, I love the Lord, and I serve God. So, in a jiffy, that's what I can tell you about myself. Nice. You did mention about MBA. Yes. How do you juggle work with the MBA and church activities? I think that everything in life begins and ends with a decision yeah. and um, at the time when I made up my mind to go in for an MBA it wasn't just because that was what was in vogue and so yeah. everybody was doing an MBA so I also needed one but I decided that at that point of my life I needed to further my education you know there's one thing education does to every human being education would give you enough information to make you better yeah. and so for me that is why i thought that what i had gotten to know in my undergrad i needed to know more to be able to enhance my worth as a person and that's the reason why i went in for an MBA. so i discussed it with my wife and um, it meant that i wasn't going to be home all the evenings on time and so she needed to stand in and take care of our kids and take care of the home as well. And uh, at work as well, I mentioned it to my immediate manager. And so it meant that consultation at work, at home was done. And then I was then a presbyter as well. So I mentioned it to the senior presbyter minister on duty then that this was what I had gotten myself involved in. So it meant that at home, work and at church, I had secured the consensus of all the people in this area so it was easier to be able to devote my time to study and uh, go for lectures and do all the other things that was required of me as a student so that was it interesting you did mention that you were married to a wonderful woman how long have you been married well by the grace of god december 18th will be exactly 10 years since we got married uh, we got married in December 18, 2004, at Koforidua, and so uh, God willing, in December I'll be celebrating my 10th wedding anniversary. Would you give us a gist of how it all started? Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I met my wife when she came into my office one day to inquire about the availability of my boss for a YPG program. We were in the same church then, but I didn't know her much. So we struck up an acquaintance when she came to look for my boss. Apparently my boss wasn't there, so I and I was the next in command. I had to engage her and uh, let her feel at home. And um, Ultimately, my boss couldn't arrive that day, so uh, that is when it began. She kept calling to find out when my boss was going to be available, 
And each time she called, uh, we also took the opportunity to, to talk about ourselves. And um, so an acquaintance grew to friendship. And uh, when I became convinced that uh, that was the way to go, I remember it was one Saturday afternoon or so. I just drove to her house. And uh, I went to tell her that I think that we should take our friendship to the next level. And I didn't beat about the bush like some men would do. I just went straight to the point and I told her that I wanted her to be my wife. It wasn't uh, any uh, orchestrated or planned event because she was busy doing her house chores on a Saturday for most ladies in Ghana. And then I went straight to the point to hit the nail right on the head. And uh, this was prior to we being friends for quite some time. So that's how it began. And by the grace of God, in 2004, we got together as a husband and wife. And God has been good from then till now. Wow. Wow. You did mention you had kids, four kids. Yeah. Their name. My kids are named the first one, he is a boy, mm -hmm. and uh, he's in Shira Papaya, Adomopon. And uh, the second born, we decided to give thanks to God for gracing us with a second child, so we called her Aseda Jamera Adomopon. And the third is also a girl. We began singing praise to God then. So we call her Ayi Asantoa Adomopon. And the fourth, who is the last, I know a lot of my friends will contest me on this, but on authority I can confirm that that's the last. Mm -hmm. She is Nyamiye because we believe that God has been good to us. So Nyamiye Ochebia Adomopon. So these are the names of my four kids. Yeah. Wow. Um, when and how did you become a born again Christian? I became born again, I would say that I first gave my life to Christ in 1995. That was the same year I finished secondary school as well. It was in a scripture union meeting that um, someone spoke about giving your life to Christ. And I remember my assistant headmaster then, I understand he's a reverend minister now, uh, Reverend Amate Ama, he showed us a film on the rapture and the whole school was set ablaze by the consciousness that hey this whole world we are parading we needed to do more with our lives than just live it and so that was when I, I sort of embraced the consciousness of becoming born again and so I walked forward, I gave my life to Christ. But believe you me, I really didn't understand what it meant. Uh, all I knew was that you need to make a public um, accession to the fact that you accept Christ, which I did. So I fully became convinced about my faith in 1996, when I was waiting to enter the university. And um, way back, I lived with my uncle, then Alatebi Okoshi when uh, a couple of other young men and women as well who were just about entering university uh, had come together to fellowship, to pray, and to learn the word of God. It was this time that I really came to my senses that I had become a Christian. And so that was when I could say that I had made a transition from just being someone who never knew Jesus to someone who knew Jesus, being born again. And so it was around that period that uh, I fully became aware of who I had become in the Lord and came to understand what the scriptures uh, meant and what was expected of me as well as a believer. So that was then. Uh, and by God's grace, I have been able to keep the faith till now. Amen. Um, it is said that train up a child the way he should go, yeah. and when he grows, he will never depart from it. You see your children playing a very active role in church activities. How do you do that? I think that my children draw the inspiration of 
what we do at home. My personal philosophy in life is that the church is a collection of godly families. If every family in the church will focus on their family, we will not have trouble at church. Okay, so in, in, in our home as well, we do church at home, we study the scriptures, we pray, we fast. Sometimes we have communion at home as a family and uh, we let our children understand the relevance of the word of God in our lives. And so I'm sure when they get into the church setting, uh, they feel comfortable, they feel at home, and they want to do the things they've been doing at home. For me, I think it's only the beginning because I want my children, or we want our children to really love the Lord and do more for God than we have done. That is the time that I can begin or we can begin to celebrate the fact that we have done a good job on with our kids and um, we have led them in the way of the Lord. So until then, I still think that there's still more room for improvement, more work to be done. Yes. Sometimes I'm, I'm convinced to call you Minister. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Minister Adam. Um, what influences your decision, like your motives, your style of preaching? Because I can see God is really ministering through you. What motivates preaching? I when 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 I became a Christian, I was introduced to a lot of prayer, and so I could pray a lot and. Um, Way back in my undergraduate days, everybody who knew me on campus knew me. Uh, I was the prayer secretary uh, for University Christian Fellowship for two terms. And so everybody who knew me knew me that I was the prayer type. Pray, 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 pray. But whilst on campus, one of the things that God kept speaking to my heart about was the fact that I needed to build a closer relationship with His Word. And so each time I take the scriptures, I see different things. And so I began writing down most of the things that God would teach me as I read the scriptures. So most of the things I know as a believer, I learned them directly under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit as I read my Bible, as I studied my Bible. And so I have a couple of notebooks that I, I write things that God teach, teaches me during times of meditation. And I believe that my, there are three ministers of the kingdom who have um, influenced my life. Uh, the first being Reverend J.F.K. Mensah. Uh, on campus days, we used to call him the walking Bible. Mm -hmm. He could quote the scriptures accurately. And I became a disciple together with some friends of mine under his feet, where on Sunday evenings he would put us together and he will teach us severally. He will teach us about eschatology. He will teach us about uh, the various types of hell as described in the Bible. He will teach us about evangelism. And so I was imparted a lot during those days as we studied under his feet. Again, uh, a couple of uh, my friends who we used to pray with, when we used to pray or meet to pray, we share fellowship by the word and uh, we share a lot of scriptures encouraging ourselves so i pick up a couple from there and then one other minister that has been instrumental in my life has been the ministry of uh, pastor chris oyakiloni um the reason why i draw a lot of inspiration from pastor chris oyakiloni is that he teaches about the born again experience and so if you listen to most of my sermons I emphasize that. I believe that nobody can become a meaningful believer without understanding who he has become in Christ Jesus. And each time you listen to Pastor Chris Oyakilomi, he, he, he emphasizes on the fundamentals. And he has influenced my life greatly. Uh, I'm, I have no apologies about that. Um, I, I know a couple of my friends 
uh, anytime there is any news about Pastor Chris, I'm the first person they will call. I say, have you heard what your pastor has done? He said this, he said that, he said that. I say, yes. He might say all of those things and people do make mistakes. The fact that he has made a mistake does not mean that uh, I should not continue to allow myself to be inspired by him. Um, again, I am influenced also by Mike Mudok. And um, I, I love his books and I read his books. And um, again as well, I would also talk about Reverend Gideon Popolampo. Um, with my interaction with Reverend Popolampo, he, one thing I like about Reverend Popolampo is he does not believe in hysterical Christianity. When I mean hysterical Christianity, you know most young people are hysterical about their faith. Uh, we talk and use all spiritual jargons, blah, blah, blah. But Papa will bring you down to the earth. He wants you to be very practical about your faith. And, and that is one thing I would always remember him for. Each time I had a couple of books I was putting together in writing, I would go and have a discussion with him. The first question he would ask me is, who is your target audience? Who, who, who do you want to reach out to? And when I say, Papa, this is my target audience, he will come again like, so what is the message you want to put across? And each time he keeps punching me with those questions, it gives him the opportunity to reflect. And so I have learned a lot from, 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 from him as well. And uh, these are the servants of God and others whose name maybe I might not be able to mention because I listen to a lot of um, preachers as well, um, have helped groomed me and groomed my understanding about the faith and what I believe in. So that's what I, I have to say when it comes to matters about my faith and my, my style of ministry. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the question. Would you be a Presbyterian minister? You are not the first to ask me this question, and I'm sure you'll not be the last to ask me this question. I would put it this way. Am I called? Yes, I know I'm called. And I think every Christian is called as well. Um, would I become a Presbyterian minister? As we speak currently, no. Why do I say so? I believe that it is not all of us who must become Presbyterian ministers. In this end time, God is calling all of us to different kinds of ministries. I am not surprised now even people who minister through songs are being called ministers. In, if you check the scriptures, it is not only reverend ministers who are called of God. You and I are called of God. What you are doing is ministry as far as the Spirit of God is back in it. Ministry is basically about service. I don't think that I would one day wear a collar or I need to one day wear the collar before I, I see myself as a minister. So I see myself still doing ministry. That is why people who tell me that, uh, won't you go to Trinity? Trinity is not the only place to go to become a minister. But I see myself doing the work of God as I'm doing now. Uh, I believe that based on things that I have heard from God and what God has told me, I might not end up being a reverend so and so in a Presbyterian minister. But I'll still be doing the work of God wherever I find myself. I'll still be serving the interest of God. For me, I, 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 I have a different perspective about church. Church is more than the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. Church is the body of Christ. And so, whilst on campus, I, that is why I, I, I was so much involved in the GAFES, University Christian Fellowship. I think one of the things we have lost track on as Christians today is our focus on denominationalism, where we want to compartmentalize God and say that this is how Presbyterians do their things. This is how the Baptists does their things. This is how Pentecost does their things. The central theme of our faith is Christ. And so that should be the focus at every point in time. And at every point in time, if 
God gives me the opportunity to serve him like I'm doing now in the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. Yeah. Uh, I will do it and do it more. Yeah. In ministry, we have experience. Sure. Tell me, what has been your worst experience okay. in your ministry? I, I wouldn't say worse, but challenging experiences. I have two of them. I remember on campus, um, we used to go for door-to-door -door evangelism, and you knock on the door of someone, and you enter their room, want to share the gospel with them. Then there was this time I knocked on a door, and I was asked to come in, so I went in. Then lo and behold, there were four, there were three or four, gentlemen there. And by the way, I was in Commonwealth. It's the best hall to be in when you're in the University of Ghana. <laughs> yes, I mean, no two is about that. You can ask anybody. It's the hall to be in. I agree. Yes. <laughs> and so I enter the, the room and I begin to share the word of God. And I was brief. About three to five minutes, I was done sharing the gospel. Then these people kept punching holes at what I had said. It was later I got to know they were all Jehovah Witnesses. And so they, they took me on a couple of things I had said about the Trinity, about who God was, about the fact that Jesus came to die in person. And then I did not have my theology very much grounded like I do now. And so they asked me a couple of questions I really couldn't answer. So when I was leaving the room, I was asking myself, did I really come to mm -hmm. be spoken to or to speak to people? I was confused. Yeah. And I believe it happens to a lot more people who go on evangelism. And my encouragement to them is that it is true that we are supposed to go and share the word of God. But it's an expression of your faith. You must go and share your faith. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go for evangelism and we have turned it into a theological argument where we want to prove the Godhead and all of that. I believe if I was straight to the point about the fact that, like the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians says, verse five, chapter 5, verse 19 to 20, where it talks about the fact that God is calling all men unto himself, not counting their sins against them. And that is the gospel. The gospel is the fact that no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, God is calling you unto himself, not counting what you have done against him, against you. Yeah. If I had gone on that basis, I believe I would not have had a lot of punches like I had that day. But thanks be to God, I didn't throw in the towel then. I continued. And one other challenging experience I had was at uh, a place called Akwemufie. I had a friend who loved the Lord, and he's going to be with the Lord now, by name Alex Abuaji. He came from Akwemufie, so... Um, and we used to do a lot of ministry on campus. One time he said that um, we needed to go and evangelize in his hometown. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine just as two of us going to hold a crusade in Akamufie. Mm -hmm. And we were two men contractors. We go to have a door-to-door -door evangelism mm -hmm. during the daytime. And then in the evening we hold a crusade. So when he sings... And, or he leads praise and worship, then I will preach that night. When I lead praise and worship, then he preaches. And we had gone to Akamufi well prepared, having fasted, having prayed, expecting a harvest of souls. And believe you me, the first day of the crusade, we fixed our equipment and people were not coming. We were there, made all the noise we could, people were still not coming. Then a few people gathered at the crusade grounds and I was preaching that day. And I began to preach just about five to ten minutes into the message. Then the rain started coming down. Wow! We have struggled in this town and we are now beginning to get our rhythm right. And here were the rains. And it rained heavily. I mean, it did not rain cat and dogs. I'm sure it rained Elephants and hippopotamus. <laughs> Very strong dreams. Yeah. Then I remembered certain testimonies I have heard. How people like Joshua still the son. Yeah. And I remember that day, I went on my knees together with my friend Alex. And we prayed a certain prayer. 
And after the prayer, the rain stopped. I kept that Bible as a memorial. I had to give it out to somebody who didn't have a Bible. And so I dashed it out. I've showed it to you. But that Bible stayed with me because that day, I felt the power of God come strongly in our circumstance, even to the point of stopping rain mm -hmm. so that the crusade could go on. We did not have a bumper harvest of souls like we were looking for, but it taught us the lesson that when the people decide to do something for God, it takes only God to stop them. The other lesson it taught us as well was the fact that we needed to get closer to God. You know, people have all kinds of misconceptions about ministry. But I have learned from the scriptures that the first thing, Jesus, the first reason why Jesus called the disciples, the first is that he said he called them to be with him. It was when they had been with him and learned from him that he could send them. A lot of people today are in haste to do ministry. A lot of people today are in haste to go and say something. What are you going to say? A friend of mine used to say, you say God has called you. Has he sent you? Okay, so it taught us that lesson so deeply and that we needed to get closer to God, to hear more from God, and to stay more with God at his feet. So each time I cast my man back since 1995-96, since I became a Christian, this has been my, the two most challenging experiences I have had with my faith until now. Wow. That was very insightful. But in as much as we have the worst experiences, I know we have some very good experiences. Absolutely. Yes. Would you share that with us as okay. well? I'll share two experiences as well. I think in my final year at the university, I joined the Legon Pentecostal Union, LPU, to minister in the Upper East Region for size. And after we had fasted and prayed, I was part of the prayer team, the intercessors for that particular mission. And so we had prayed for long during that period. Then I remember in the evenings, we'll go to the crusade grounds and minister the word of God and come back. So was it the second day or so after the close of the crusade, when we were going back to our resting place, the president approached me and said that, Ronald, you are preaching the next day. And I was like, wow. I came here, I did not have in mind I was going to be part of the preachers. My only focus was that I was going to join the intercessory group. We pray, and during the day we go for house-to-house -house evangelism. And that night when I mounted the podium, I remember very well at Borga, I think that I preached one of my best sermons ever on salvation. And I preached for barely 20 minutes and I made the altar call. And here there were a lot of people responding to the call of God to give their lives to Christ. I must say I was very humbled by that experience. After the crusade, a lot of people came by to congratulate me and they tell me that they never knew I could preach. They thought that uh, my only thing was to pray. And I had a good friend who was part of the mission, Samuel Adodebra. Mm -hmm. He came to give me a hug. And I remember what he said. He says, that was a good sermon. It was a good one. And looking back, it has been one of the highest points for me in ministry. The other example I would give was the challenge we had as a church at Hope Congregation when uh, Reverend Popolambo was transferred. And that Sunday, I was supposed to minister. A lot of things had gone on in the church. And there were some of the things I didn't agree with. Um, I kept things to myself. For those who I thought would listen, I shared with them. Some people disagreed with me. Because there is one thing God has taught me, and that's the fact that when it comes to dealing with the servants of God, you have to be careful. See, because 
God knows the way he deals with his children. And so, you might not be happy about what is happening, and you might think that you have been given an unfair treatment. But as a servant of God, you are dealing with So you have to manage the whole thing well. Be sure that what you are doing is inspired by God. When it comes to matters of the faith, we must learn to understand that faith business is different from sense business. That is why faith and common sense are not the same. They are two different things. And so when I was given the opportunity that day to preach, I remember um, the female reverend minister we had then uh, spoke to me and said that I'll be preaching the Sunday. So one of the things I do each time I have a preaching appointment is to go to God and ask God, what do you have for your people? And God spoke to my heart about calling the whole church to order. I sat down and as I prayed and I prepared, I asked myself, look at the entire church that one way or the other feels wounded, feels disappointed about the way the hierarchy of the church is dealing with them. So God, you really must come through today. And I remember that message very well. After I had preached and called the entire church to order, if you ask me from that day till now, it is my best message ever to have preached at Hope Congregation. Not because I enjoyed the message, but I have read about the revivals of the Charles Finney's and all the rest. That day, I could see revival in the church. Because I could see that the whole church came to the point of prayer. And telling God, God, we may not have understood what you did. We may not have understood what you made to happen. And we come to you, strengthening our hearts. Somebody called me after the second service and said, Brother Nad, I thought you were going to preach the third service because I hear you preach a powerful service in the second service. But in the third service, someone else was preaching. And I said, you just need to get to the tape and just listen to it. I mentioned these two points as references of higher points in my ministry because in each of them, I could see people coming to God. See, ministry is all about people. Ministry is not about the wonderful accolades that are showered on you, Papa, mm -hmm. Reverend, uh, Osofo, Bishop, Archbishop, and all of that. Apostle, Super Apostle. Ministry is not about all of those things. Ministry is about the people. The people who are hearing the word of God. If you have a ministry and you preach and the word of God does nothing to the people, I think that you need to revise your notes. And that is why Jesus was a, was a successful minister. Because he had it very well with the people. And so he would use the circumstances of the people to preach to them and to minister to them. Even when he was rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they realized the truth of his word. And so they had to respond one way or the other. And so these two points are, are mentioned because, like I said, they drew people to God. And for me, that is the ultimate after I have preached for people to respond to God in the affirmative and to go with God with their lives. And um, I think I remember those points and I give praise to Jesus for drawing men unto himself. Amen. 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 That was very powerful. And people are nervous, people are shy. Yeah. Anytime you mount the altar, how do you feel the experience? Okay. I... I will tell you frankly, each time I, I amount the pulpit to preach, yeah. it is a different experience altogether. And there are various ways in which people sense the anointing. Yeah. People sense the anointing through singing. Uh, people sense the anointing through the singing of hymns. People sense the anointing when the word of God is with them or they hear the word of God. I think that I'm a combination of all of these. Okay. And each time it is my intent to preach, there's an unusual presence of God that I experience. 
and I keep telling the the Royals of Hope especially because I haven't had the opportunity to speak to the church choir yet. But I keep telling the Royals of Hope they should not take their ministry for granted. It is the ministry that launches the minister to go and minister the word of God. And so if they joke with it and they think that, well, we have just come singing, they miss a lot of things. And you, if you've watched my ministry style for some time, you'd realize that I always go with, on the wings of the song that just last ended. Because if the song has ministered to people, why do you change it? Yeah. And if God is the same spirit you are ministering with, why wouldn't he use you as a vehicle as well to minister? So each time it's my intent to minister, I sense an unusual presence of God. And it comes in the form of, I feel this whole presence with me. I don't know how to describe it anyway, but I feel this whole presence with me. And all of a sudden, the scriptures just open up to me. And sometimes I prepare a sermon to preach in 15 minutes. And I, I, by the end of the day, you would have seen I would have preached about 30 minutes or 40, like today. I mean, I had, I had just four slides because I knew that these days we were working to contain ourselves within time. And by the time I had realized, I had preached 45 minutes. And I asked myself, where did it come from? Because when God is at work, when God is at work, and I would want to let all of us understand, when God is at work, Sometimes, time is not a good restraint. I know the scripture which says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And I believe it, that we must be able to control ourselves and do things in order. I am not against it. But when we get carried away, sometimes it is difficult to land. And so, um, when I am behind the altar ministering, that is how I feel. I sense an unusual presence of God. And God taught me this some time past. He says that each time you are given the opportunity to minister, note that there is an anointing that is available for that ministry. And that's what a lot of people don't know. All I do is to take advantage of that anointing at that moment. And once I take advantage of that anointing at that moment, it is a different ballgame altogether. I'll tell you this. There was a time I needed to minister at church. And after waiting on God, God, I couldn't hear anything from God. And so my notepad was dry. And I struggled to preach in the first service, though people thought that it was a good sermon. I struggled to preach in the first service. But whilst the praises for the second service was going, then God began to speak to me. So people realized that I took my notepad and I began to scribble things. And by the time... I preached the second service. It was an awesome experience. And so what I would tell to ministers who minister is that you might prepare your sermon, but don't close the chapter on God when you mount the pulpit. Because God can still send a word to you in season for his people. He can still send an example to you in season for his people. And then they'll be blessed and transformed by it. So that is my experience, mm -hmm. Esther. Yeah. Um, I did a little research okay. on you, and I know this question is going to throw you off board, <laughs> but what is so special about the age 21? And that's Yao Anane ring a bell? Yes, he so. does. Um, the age 21 for me is the age of decision. I say the age of decision because I grew up with my parents for a while, and then my parents traveled abroad, so I had to live with my grannies, and that's where I did my GHS. And whilst I lived with my grannies, I had two cousins. They were all older than me. Then the first one turned 21, and he died. He was Kojuanani. And the other turned 21, it was... That was just when we had, um, I think, finished secondary school and were about entering the university. He just turned 21 and he fell ill mysteriously and he died. And I was the next young man to come close to that age. I think I was around 18, 19 then. And so, proud to this, I had studied a lot about 
dealing with spiritual forces and dealing with gates and dealing with all kinds of powers as, as, as I, 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 I fellowship with other people. And so it just clicked in my spirit that something was amiss. And so I needed to deal with the issue of 21 just before I turned 21 as well. So I entered into my closet in prayer. And as I prayed, God began to speak to me about certain family history and uh, which I needed to deal with in prayer. So I spent a lot of time fasting and praying. And I remember those days, my grandparents and my uncles didn't understand me because I was on a fast almost every day because I knew what I had seen. And I was the only one God spoke to. As to whether what he said made sense or not, the only proof of it was for me to turn 21. And so, in my prayer closet, as I dealt with it and I prayed, then I remember that I shouldn't only pray for myself to jump the queue. But there were a lot of younger people in my family as a who would turn 21 one day. So I needed to institute a perpetual injunction on the kingdom of darkness so that they, they, they would stop taking the lives of people who turned 21 in my family. And after I have dealt with this issue in prayer and I had prevailed in prayer and I had won in prayer, I turned 21 and my 21st birthday is one of the most wonderful birthdays I had had. I was then in the university. It was special because I enjoyed, I enjoyed the birthday. I didn't grow up uh, to birthday parties and all of that and so I'm not too used to it but on my 21st birthday I enjoyed a lot of gifts from my friends on campus it was special and so then I began to understand the essence of numbers in the realms of the spirit and the fact that in our work with God God has chosen us as people who need to bring our families out of uh, all the challenges that we encounter one way or the other so to cut us a long story short, that was the experience. And so your research proved to be true. Yeah. Who is Master Jima? Master Jima is a young teacher who inspired me to love mathematics. Um, at the junior high level, um, I, I, I used to be math phobia. And uh, he really drilled me to get the subjects into my, my head. And uh, by the time I got to secondary school, I, I was so used to math because there were a lot of tricks in math that he taught me. And he taught me to love the subject. And so, you know, JHS curriculum, SHS curriculum, as far as mathematics is concerned, it's a scaling up. And so if you get the basics right, you would be able to do right. And so that's what I would say about math. Jima. He's the inspirational math teacher who got me to the next level. I'm sure you're wondering how I found out. Uh, we did a lot of digging on you. I can imagine. <laughs> now let's move to general issues. Okay. What is your opinion about church becoming involved in politics these days? The church, if you care to know, is a political institution. Why do I say that? Jesus says that I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That means that the church itself is a formidable institution. Yeah. It has the word of God. Politics without word, instruction, information is useless. So the church itself is a politics. It has the word of God. It is the basis upon which we adjudicate the matters of this life. Prayer is, 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 is one key way the church makes declaration and brings about change. The other is the teaching of the word of God. So I think that the church and politics are not afar off. That said, I have an issue with the politics of today. Okay. And I believe that is where your question is, 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 is centered. Mm -hmm. And I know what people, how people answer, ask this question is, should Christians do politics? The answer is yes and no. Why do I say that? There are very good politicians in the Bible. 
Talk of Joseph. He was a good politician. Talk of Daniel. He was a good politician. Even talk of Moses. He was the savior, but he was a politician. And so, they are good politicians in the scriptures. And so it means that if the scriptures were written as examples for us, then the church must not do away with politics. The second reason why I believe that the church must be involved in politics, or Christians must be involved in politics, is the fact that in today's world, where politicians wield a lot of power and influence, to change anything, you need that political mandate to be able to change it. But the problem I have, which leads to the no, is the fact that just as people are called to preach, and people are called to teach, and people are called as prophets, I believe as well that there are people who are called into politics. These people are endowed with a special grace, like the sermon I preached today. I mean, people enter into politics, they were fine Christians, they were doing well with the faith, and they enter into politics and they sell their heritage for a brand new car. They enter into politics and, and, and they trade their conscience for a mansion. These people cannot be said to be successful Christians in politics. And so should Christians enter politics? Yes, but they must be called. Because the politics of today is dangerous. Power enters into the hands of people who don't know how to use it, and so they abuse power. We need Christians who are the light of the world to say no when no must be said. We need people who are firm to take a decision that will only last them one term in, in office. Yet, tomorrow, when we are assessing successful politicians, they will be counted. And so, all Christians who aspire to go into politics, my message to you is that be called. If you are not called, don't venture. Other than that, we might go to heaven without you. You might sell your birthright like Esau did. And Bible says afterwards, he sought it with tears. He couldn't find it. But if you are called, I give you my blessing. And people begin to see that as you are in the faith, all of a sudden you begin to desire to, to enter into politics. It might be an inclination of a calling, but be sure before you enter. And be sure of what role in politics you are supposed to play. Whether you are supposed to be a legislator in, in, by way of a parliamentarian, whether you are supposed to be at the forefront like a, a president, whether you are supposed to be part of the judiciary, or maybe as a member of the Council of State. And uh, you, you must be sure where your calling actually sits before you enter there. Don't say that because you're a good preacher, you'll be a good politician. It doesn't work that way. The dynamics are different altogether. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that also brings me to the question. The same Christians in church yeah. are the same people you find in big positions yeah. in the office. Yeah. Christianity and corruption, your, your opinion. I think it's practically very simple. Christians must understand that we have a standard. And we must live that standard. Until we live that standard, we have failed Jesus. Christians, some Christians are good talkers. They can rattle the word of God. But when it comes into action, then they are failing. And somebody says that there are a lot of Christians, yet corruption is on the ascendancy. Even Paul says this in the scriptures. It says that where sin abound, grace abound them all. So you would find the contra together always. But I believe that you and I must begin to send the right message across and say that we are Christians. It does not mean we just go to church. It means that we have the seed of God in us. We have the character of God in us. What a lot of Christians who sacrifice their conscience forget is that the reputation of God is at stake. On any business transaction you undertake as a Christian, God's reputation is at stake. If you blow it, you have blown God's reputation. 
And these are the guiding principles that helped people like Joseph to resist the offer from Mrs. Potiphar. And these are the guiding principles that undergirded the thought of Daniel, who purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the portions of the king's meat. Like I said today at church, it begins with a decision. I have made that choice. You equally must make it. And all Christians who aspire to be in leadership position must make the choice that we will not allow ourselves to be corrupted. The Bible says something about Moses which I so much like. It says that he chose. He, Moses, he chose. Because remember, he was discovered by the daughter of Pharaoh. So that means he had access to the pleasantries of Egypt and to the goodies of his time. But he chose to be reckoned with the slaves that were Israelites then. Yeah. God is looking for people in leadership to make a choice and say that I am a leader who will not be corrupted. I am a leader whose conscience cannot be bought. Whether you channel it through my wife, you channel it through my, my, my children, or you channel it through my parents or my uncle, you will just not have a field day because we are aware of the fact that the reputation of God is at stake in our lives. Sure. Tell us, how does session work? Okay. Okay. Um, there's one thing I remember from my two session orientation as a session member. Basically, the session of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana is the administrative leadership of the church. Whilst the ministers, the reverend ministers, provide the spiritual leadership. And so we do it together. And the uh, session works this way. It's more like in the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, it is called the lower court. Okay. And simply put, because a session administers the affairs of a local church as to uh, what transpires on a day to day basis at a local church is administered as session. And session is not complete without the ministers. So you need the ministers, that is the spiritual leadership and the administrative leadership to constitute a session. So we talk about policies of the local church. Uh, you talk about uh, marriages. Uh, people who, who marry must come to session for us to see them as well. You, you talk about things that concern the welfare of the entire church in terms of programs that must be organized for the members of the church, in terms of um, the, all the other groups in the church, the service groups and then the uh, age-based groups as well. So session administrates all the issues that concern all of these groups and all the other members of the church as well. Uh, if it were in other jurisdictions, session would have been the church board. Yeah, I know in America, for some churches, they have the church board. So session is more like the church board. Uh, the only thing is that this board is elected. Mm -hmm. We are not appointed. We are elected to, to serve on the board for a four-year term. I like the fact that you mentioned the spiritual administration aspect of the session. What measures have you put in place to increase or to grow the spiritual level of the Presbyterian Church of than a hope congregation. Okay. The hope congregation, as we, we have come to know ourselves, we call ourselves the house of purposeful encounter. We believe as a church that you just don't need to have an encounter with God. It has to be a purposeful one. You know, Jacob met God at a place called Bethel and said, oh, so God was here, yet he slept on a stone as a pillow. So we believe at the hope congregation that our members one must know to know must know god personally and so you would realize that at church we emphasize on the fact that people must have a personal relationship with christ and so if you look at our sunday services they are scheduled such that even if you are a professional you can come to the 6 a.m service and close and go to work and the second service is also there from 7.15 right through to 9.30. Then the third service also takes off from there. In addition to that, we have the midweek service, which is purely a teaching service. 
where the word of God is broken down to its barest minimum for people to understand, ask questions. And we have labeled that the turning point service because we believe that every Wednesday when you come to God at church, God is in the business of turning your life around. Then as well, we have all night sessions at least once every other month. We also have fasting and prayer sessions. And we are in the Lent period where we are fasting and praying. And then our theme for this Lent period is the fact that if you believe, God will give you what you believe. And so as a church, this is what we have put in place to help our members grow spiritually. And one of the other things we are working towards is to have the cell meetings at places where our members live so that we can have a fellowship at the micro level and share um, the word of God and pray together. Okay. What do you like about Presbyterian Church of Ghana Hope Congregation? When you are at Hope Congregation, there's so much opportunity for you to minister, either as an evangelist, as a teacher, as a prophet, as, 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 as a pastor. There's so much room, there's so much opportunity. The other thing I like about the House of Purposeful Encounter is the youth of the church. I think that we have a youth that, is, that has lots of uh, different capabilities. And we have a youth that is thriving and that loves the Lord. And that these are the reasons why I love the Hope Congregation and uh, which inspires me to fellowship with them. Very well, well said. I know you don't do a lot of work, 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 aside the fact that you have busy schedules. What are your hobbies? What do you do for fun? Uh, do I have a hobby? It's a big <laughs> question. Eh? <laughs> Unfortunately, for quite a long time, I, I, I have come to realize I really don't have a hobby. I think that one of the things I love to do is to study the scriptures, is to read the word of God and to listen to the word of God being taught by ministers who are spirit-filled. I don't like... One of the things I don't like doing is I don't like to be bored. I don't like to be bored at all. And so... If I'm not reading the scriptures or reading a book, I might be writing my thoughts out. And so I think if, if you say that, then you want to generalize it. Then my hobbies will be around reading and writing. So in short, that is how I will put it. Anyone who comes on my show gets the opportunity to sing his or her favorite hymn. Okay. And um, I, will, I will love it if you sing your favorite Presbyterian hymn with us. Okay. My favorite Presbyterian hymn in the old hymn book used to be, I think, hymn 175. And uh, I love that hymn very much. It goes like this. Christo asa fofo monche ako de pa mo mamo Should I sing again? Yes, I love the voice. We right now we'll call um, your children Aseda, Inshira, Ayehi. Everybody to come and join Daddy. So we sing. <laughs> Where's baby? She's sleeping. Sleeping. Okay, now we're coming to sing with Daddy. Come Papa, come and stand by me. You are the big boss. Okay. Okay. That is coming to sing him 117. It used to be 175. 175. I don't know what it is in the new book now. Okay. Okay, okay you can start. <laughs> Christo asa fofo monche ako de pa mo mamo enya mo de me too, 
me more. Thank you very much, Brother Rona. Well. I don't really have a good voice, so I don't think I do the talking. <laughs> I think Daddy will introduce all of you. Okay. So, so this one. is my firstborn. He is in Shira Papayao, the Mopong. And this, the one who comes directly after him, that is Aseda Jamera. And that's our little cutie here. She is Ayi Asantua. And uh, Nyamie is asleep now, so she couldn't be part of the celebration. Uh, you might need to come back for me to showcase my <laughs> wife yes. as well. <laughs> All too soon, we have come to the end of a very wonderful life experience with Brother Ronald. Very insightful, revealing truth. And I want to thank him so much thank for you as well. um, allowing us to invade his house on a Sunday afternoon like this. And we hope to come again some other time sure. and interview you and your wife and the last baby. I mean, I want to thank my production team, the crew, and everybody who made it possible for me to be here today. And um, I want to end with Romans 12:12. 12, 12. It says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Thank you very much. Before I take a bow, we were in the hope seat with Brad Ronald, and hope to see you again sometime. Bye. Thank you.